Welcome back to my inner sanctum. I am your hostess, Countess Elizabeth, mistress of the macabre. Some tragedies are so shocking and dramatic that they permeate time. Some cases have the appeal that they generate publicity and seemingly take up all the news stories, even until this very day there are popular cases. This is one such case, my fiends. Today we are going to investigate the kidnapping of the Lindbergh baby, Charles Lindbergh Jr. So, let us look up all the clues left to history so we can explore our grotesque curiosity. In 1927, Charles Lindbergh was one of the first to complete a non-stop transatlantic flight, an incredible feat as he was welcomed as a hero in the United States. But not five years later, in 1932, Charles Lindbergh's name was in the headline again for a very different reason. Charles Augustus Lindbergh Jr., the 20-month-old son of famous aviator and Anne Morrow Lindbergh, was kidnapped at about 9 p.m. on March 1, 1932, from the nursery of the second floor of the Lindbergh home near Hopewell, New Jersey. The child's absence was discovered and reported to his parents, who were then at home at approximately 10 p.m., by the child's nurse, Betty Gow. A search of the premises was immediately made, and a ransom note demanding $50,000 was found in the nursery windowsill. After the Hopewell police were notified, the report was telephoned to the New Jersey State Police, who assumed charge of the investigation. During the search at the kidnapping scene, traces of mud were found on the floor of the nursery. Footprints, impossible to measure, were found under the nursery window. Two sections of ladder had been used to reach the window. One of the two sections was split or broken where it joined the other, indicating the ladder had been broken during the ascent or descent. There was no bloodstains in or around the nursery, nor were there any fingerprints. Household and estate employees were questioned and investigated. Lindbergh asked friends to communicate with their kidnappers, and they made widespread appeals for the kidnappers to start negotiations. A second ransom note was received by Lindbergh on March 6, 1932, postmark Brooklyn, New York, March 4th, in which the ransom demanded was increased to $70,000. A police conference was then called by the governor at Trenton, New Jersey, and which was attended by prosecuting officials, police authorities, and government representatives. Various theories and policies of procedure were discussed. Private investigators were also employed by Lindbergh's attorney, Colonel Henry Beckenridge. A third ransom note was received by the Lindbergh's attorney on March 8th, informing that an intermediary appointed by the Lindbergh's would not be accepted and requested a note in the newspaper. On the same day, Dr. John F. Condon of Bronx, New York, a retired school principal, published in the Bronx Home News an offer to act as a go-between and pay an additional $1,000 ransom. The following day, the fourth ransom note was received by Dr. Condon, which indicated he would be an acceptable go-between. This was approved by Lindbergh. About March 10, 1932, Condon received $70,000 in cash as ransom and immediately started negotiations for payment through newspaper columns using the name Half C. About 8.30 p.m. on March 12th, after receiving an anonymous phone call, Dr. Condon received the fifth ransom note, delivered by Joseph Perone, a taxi cab driver, who received it from an unidentified stranger. The message stated that another note would be found beneath a stone at a vacant stand, 100 feet from the outlying subway station. This note, the sixth, was found by Condon as indicated. Following instructions therein, the doctor met an unidentified man who called himself John at Woodlong Cemetery near 203rd Street and Jerome Avenue. They discussed payment of the ransom money. The stranger agreed to furnish a token of the child's identity. Condon was accompanied by a bodyguard, except while talking to John. During the next few days, Dr. Condon repeated his advertisements, urging further contact and stating his willingness to pay the ransom. A baby sleeping suit as a token of identity and a seventh ransom note were received by Dr. Condon on March 16th. The suit was delivered to Lindbergh and later identified. Condon continued his advertisements. The eighth ransom note was received by Condon on March 21st, insisting on complete compliance and advising the kidnapping had been planned for a year. On March 29th, Betty Gow, the Lindbergh's nurse, found the infant's thumb guard worn at the time of the kidnapping near the entrance to the estate. The following day, a ninth ransom note was received by Condon, threatening to increase the demand to $100,000 and refusing a code for the newspaper columns. The tenth ransom note, received by Dr. Condon on April 1st, 1932, instructed him to have the money ready the following night, to which Condon replied up by ad in the press. The eleventh ransom note was delivered to Condon on April 2nd, 1932, by an unidentified taxi driver who said he received it from an unknown man. Dr. Condon found the twelfth ransom note under a stone in front of the greenhouse 
at 3225 Tremont Avenue, Bronx, New York. Shortly thereafter, on the same evening, by following the instructions contained in the 12th note, Condon again met with whom he believed to be John to reduce the demand to $50,000. This amount was handed to the stranger in exchange for a receipt and the 13th note containing instructions to the effect that the kidnapped child could be found on a boat named Nellie near Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. The stranger then walked north into the park woods. The following day, an unsuccessful search was for the baby was made near Martha's Vineyard. The search was later repeated. Dr. Condon was positive he would recognize John if he ever saw him again. On May 12th, delivery driver Orville Wilson and his assistant William Allen pulled to the side of the road about 4.5 miles or 7.2 kilometers south of the Lindbergh home near the hamlet of Mount Rose in neighboring Hopewell Township. When Alan went into the grove of trees to urinate, he discovered the body of a toddler. The skull was badly fractured and the body decomposed, having been chewed on by animals. There was an indication of an attempt at a hasty burial. Gao identified the body as the missing infant from the overlapping toes of the right foot and a shirt she had made. It appeared the child had been killed by a blow to the head. Lindbergh insisted on cremation. In June 1932, officials began to suspect that the crime had been perpetrated by someone the Lindberghs knew. Suspicion fell on Violet Sharp, a British household servant at the Morrow home who had given contradictory information regarding her whereabouts on the night of the kidnapping. It was reported that she appeared nervous and suspicious when questioned. She committed suicide on June 10, 1932 by ingesting silver polish that contained cyanide just before being questioned for a fourth time. Her alibi was later confirmed and police were criticized for the heavy-handedness. After the discovery of the body, Condon remained unofficially involved in the case. To the public, he became a suspect and in some circles he was vilified. For the next two years, he visited police departments and pledged to find Cemetery John. Condon's actions regarding this case was increasingly flamboyant. On one occasion, while riding the city bus, Condon claimed he saw a suspect on the street and, announcing his secret identity, ordered the bus to stop. The startled driver complied and Condon darted from the bus, although his target had eluded him. Condon's actions were also criticized as exploitative when he agreed to appear in a vaudeville act regarding the kidnapping. Liberty Magazine published a serialized account of Condon's involvement in the Lindbergh kidnapping under the title Half Seas Tell All. The investigators who were working on the case soon were at a standstill. There was no developments and little evidence of any sort, so the police turned their attention to tracking the ransom payments. A pamphlet was prepared with serial numbers on the ransom bills, and 2,500 copies were distributed to businesses, mainly in New York City. A few of the ransom bills appeared in scattered locations, some as far away as Chicago and Minneapolis, but those spending bills were never found. By a presidential order, all gold certificates were to be exchanged for other bills by May 1, 1933. A few days before the deadline, a man bought $2,980 to a Manhattan bank for exchange. It was later realized the bills were from the ransom. He gave the name as J.J. Faulkner at 537 West 149th Street. No one named Faulkner lived at the address, and Jane Faulkner, who lived there 20 years earlier, denied involvement. During a 30-month period, a number of ransom bills were spent throughout New York City. Detectives realized that many of the bills were being spent along the route of Lexington Avenue subway, which connected the Bronx to the east side of Manhattan, including a German-Austrian neighborhood of Yorkville. On September 18, 1934, a Manhattan bank teller noticed a gold certificate from the ransom. A New York license plate number was penciled in the bill's margin, allowing it to be traced to a nearby gas station. The station's manager had written down the license number because he thought the customer was acting suspicious and was probably a counterfeiter. The license plate belonged to a sedan owned by Richard Hauptman of 1279 East 222nd Street in the Bronx, an immigrant with a criminal record in Germany. When Hauptman was arrested, he was carrying a single $20 gold certificate and over $14,000 of the ransom money was found in his garage. Hauptmann was arrested, interrogated, and beaten at least once through the following day and night. Hauptmann stated that the money and other items had been left with him by his friend and former business partner, Isidore Fitch. Fitch had died on March 29, 1934, shortly after returning to Germany. Hauptmann stated he learned only after Fitch's death that the shoebox that was left with him contained a considerable sum of money. He said that he kept the money because he claimed it was owed to him from a business deal that he and Fitch made. Hauptmann consistently denied any connection to the crime or knowledge that the money in his house was from the ransom. When the police searched Hauptmann's home, they found a considerable amount of additional evidence that linked him to the crime. One item was a notebook that contained a sketch of a construction ladder similar to that found in the Lindbergh's home in March 1932. John Condon's telephone number, along with his address, were discovered written on the closet wall in the house. A key piece of evidence, a section of wood, 
was discovered in the attic of the home. After being examined by an expert, it was determined to be an exact match to the wood used in the construction of the ladder found at the scene of the crime. Hauptmann was indicted in the Bronx on September 24, 1934, for extorting the $50,000 ransom from Charles Lindbergh. Two weeks later, on October 8th, Hauptmann was indicted in New Jersey for the murder of Charles Augustus Lindbergh Jr. Two days later, he was surrendered to New Jersey authorities by the New York governor to face charges directly related to the kidnapping and murder of the child. Hauptmann was charged with capital murder. The trial was held at Hunter Down County Courthouse in Flemington, New Jersey, and was soon dubbed the trial of the century. Reporters swarmed the town and every hotel room was booked. Evidence against Hauptmann included the $20,000 of ransom money found in his garage, and testimony alleging that his handwriting and spelling were similar to those on the ransom notes. Eight handwriting experts pointed out similarities between the ransom notes and Hauptmann's writing specimens. The state introduced photographs demonstrating the part of the wood from the ladder matched the plank from the floor of Hauptmann's attic. The type of wood, the direction of tree growth, the milling pattern, the inside of the outside surface of the wood, and the grain on both sides were identical, and four oddly placed nail holes lined up with the nail holes and joists of Hauptmann's attic. Condon's address and telephone number were written in pencil on a closet door in Hauptmann's home. Hauptmann told police he had written Condon's address down. Hauptmann claimed, I must have read it in the paper about the story. I was a little bit interested and kept a little bit of record of it, and maybe I was just in the closet and was reading the paper and put down the address. I can't give you any explanation about the phone number. A sketch that an expert suggested represented a ladder was found in one of Hauptmann's notebooks. Hauptmann said the picture and other sketches were works of a child. Despite not having an obvious source of income, Hauptmann bought a $400 radio, approximately equivalent to $7,740 in 2020, and sent his wife on a trip to Germany. Hauptmann was identified as the man to whom the ransom money was delivered. Other witnesses testified that it was Hauptmann who spent some of Lindbergh's gold certificates, that he had been seen in the area of the estate in East Amwell, New Jersey, near Hopewell, on the day of the kidnapping, and that he had been absent from work on the day of the ransom payment and had quit his job two days later. Hauptmann never sought another job afterwards, yet continued to live comfortably. When the prosecution rested its case, the defense opened with a lengthy examination of Hauptmann. In his testimony, Hauptmann denied being guilty, insisting that the box of gold certificates had been left in his garage by Isidore Fitch, who returned to Germany in December 1933 and died there March 34. Hauptmann said that he had one day found a shoebox left behind by Fitch, which Hauptmann stored on the top shelf of his kitchen broom closet. Later discovering the money, which he later found to be almost $40,000, or approximately $600,000 in 2019. Hauptmann had said because Fitch had owed him about $7,500 in business funds, Hauptmann had kept the money for himself and lived on it since January 1934. The defense called Hauptmann's wife, Anna, to corroborate Fitch's story. On cross-examination, she admitted that while she hung up her apron every day on a hook higher than the top shelf, she could not remember seeing any shoebox there. Later, rebuttal witnesses testified that Fitch could not have been at the scene of the crime, and he had no money for medical treatments when he died of tuberculosis. Fitch's landlady testified that he could barely afford the $3.50 weekly rent of his room. In his closing examination, defense argued that the evidence against Hauptmann was cer entirely circumstantial because no reliable witnesses had placed Hauptmann at the scene of the crime, nor were his fingerprints found on the ladder, on the ransom notes, or anywhere in the nursery. Hauptmann was convicted and immediately sentenced to death. His attorneys appealed to the New Jersey Court of Errors and Appeals. New Jersey Governor Harold J. Hoffman secretly visit Hauptmann in his cell the evening of October 16th, accompanied by a stenographer who spoke fluent German. Hoffman urged members of the Court of Error and Appeal to visit Hauptmann. In late January 1936, while declaring that he had no position on the guilt or innocence of Hauptmann, Governor Hoffman cited evidence that the crime was not a one-person job and directed detectives to continue a thorough and impartial investigation. On March 30th, 1936, Hauptmann's second and final appeal asking for clemency from the New Jersey Board of Pardons was denied. Hauptmann turned down a large offer from Hearst newspaper for a confession and refused a last-minute offer to commute his sentence from the death penalty to life without parole in exchange for a confession. He was electrocuted on April 3, 1936. There are some alternative theories on this case as well that point to Hauptmann as being innocent. Several suggest that Charles Lindbergh was responsible for the kidnapping. One theory is that Lindbergh accidentally killed his son in a prank gone wrong. Defense attorney Gregory Algreen claims Lindbergh climbed a ladder and brought his son out the window, but dropped the child, killing him, so he hid the body in the woods and covered up the crime by blaming Hauptmann. An alternative theory in the case is that he killed his son because he had defects and Lindbergh did not want to have a son who had any problems. Lloyd C. Gardner, professor of history emeritus, 
points to Lindbergh's fascination with social Darwinism. One article states, The evidence against Hauptmann is quite compelling, but the evidence of him being the sole kidnapper is less compelling. Once you conclude it was conducted by a group of more than one person, the question becomes why. Although the child's health and physical condition at the time of his abduction were downplayed and even hidden from the curious public and law enforcement by Lindbergh and the boy's doctor, he appeared to have been afflicted with a rickets-like condition that affected the development of strong bones. He required mega doses of vitamin D and daily exposure to a sun lamp kept cribside. He also had hammer toes on his left foot, a large cranium, and unfused skull bones. So this theory pretty much states that Lindbergh was involved in the murder because of the child's ailments and wanting to have perfect children. Alas, it seems we'll never learn if this accusation is true, and as it stands, Hauptmann is the one responsible for the kidnapping and the murder. Well, that was truly a grotesque tale. I've heard the theory that Charles Lindbergh was actually the one who killed his son, or had another man do it for him, and to me this is an interesting theory because they caught Hauptmann with the ransom money, but it's interesting that Hauptmann did say he got the money from another German person, and this other person could have been part of the crew that kidnapped baby Lindbergh. I think it's possible that Lindbergh orchestrated this kidnapping with Hauptmann and others. However, we will never really know the truth. May the souls of those involved rest in peace. Thank you for watching the video. Subscribe, like, and share if you would also like to keep exploring our grotesque curiosity. We will meet again in the darkness of the night.